Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. Um, this is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm super happy to have Mikkel Lund with us today. Hey, Mikkel. Hi, Frank. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for talking about your really lovely article that we'll get to here in a minute on this February 24th of 2022. Uh, and Mikkel, where are, you, where are you located at? I'm in the Denmark, uh, just a little bit outside Aarhus, if, uh, the second largest city in Denmark, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, working from the home office today. And I can see that it's snowing outside that window, um, yes. so we're dropping down. Um, it varies between snow and rain, so it's a bit um, depressing weather, but uh, yeah. Uh, spring's around the corner, you know, equinox is, equinox is coming up, so we'll get there. So very cool. And what is what is your position there? So you, you're at our house? Yes, uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm an assistant professor at cool. um, a center called the Stella Astrophysics Center in, uh, mm -hmm. in North. Yeah. Yep, very cool. Yep, I know a few people there. Very nice. Uh, and Mikael, what do you like to do for research? Well, my, I mean, I, I do a lot of different topics, but uh, my main research is focused on astroseismology, mm -hmm. on uh, solar-like stars mainly, so analyzing the, the oscillations of stars. Okay. Um, and this is both for, for, for stars in general, for exoplanet hosts, stars in open clusters, uh, so on. And, and then as a second part, I do a lot of, of um, data analysis, photometry, reduction, and so on, both for Kepler, K2, TESS, Plato, and so on. So that's the, the second interest and, and where this paper comes in. Are you involved in Plato at all? Um, this particular paper is, is focused only on, on, on TESS, but right. uh, I'm part of the, of the work with Plato as well, so. Okay, very cool, very cool. And we'll see the Plato pipeline come out of this as well. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ Supplements article. Test data for astroseismology, light curve systematics, correction. And Mikkel, take us away. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me thank all my, my co-authors for all their work here. And, uh, and also start by saying that this um, particular paper is, is part of a larger series of papers. Um, so this uh, start of the title test data for astroseismology is actually a group um, that's working within the uh, test astroseismic science consortium. So uh, this is a consortium that that um, uh, where most of the people with an interest for astroseismology is uh, is a member, and we sort of try to coordinate our our work on the seismology side. Do you, say, of this, um, do you say this? Uh, do you say this is the tada? <laughs> ta exactly the tada test data for astrosatmology. <laughs> um, so, so this is a group within this consortium uh, that's uh, tasked with uh, producing uh, both uh, raw photometry uh, for uh, for tests and, of course, light curve correction and also uh, a classification. So we have three uh, main papers, and this is then uh, one of them. Okay, very cool. Well, we'll put those, uh, maybe we'll get all three of them in the description below the video there. So very good. Yeah. Um, so if you could scroll down to, to the first uh, figure, I think. Yeah, here we go on the pipeline. Just to, just okay. to show you where this, um, it's a big paper, so it scrolls <laughs> slowly. Um, but just to show you where the, this particular paper comes in to the overall uh, pipeline, which is called the TASOC pipeline. So, um, so this paper focuses on the uh, second part, uh, namely the systematics correction and, and sort of preparing all the light curves for uh, astroseismic analysis and, and then delivering all these data products to the, uh, to the consortium via our TASA database. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, uh, posting all of these uh, data on MAST mm -hmm. for the broader community. Um, and so the first paper in the series takes care of the photometry and the background correction on all these things. And then the third paper takes care of the, uh, of the classification part of the, uh, of the pipeline. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. So um, you and, and the, so the, the motivation for, for, for building this, um, pipeline is as a, when, when you look at, at, for instance, 
the differences between Kepler and, uh, and TESS is that in, um, in TESS, uh, the, the main uh, focus or the main um, data source to fulfill the, the science requirements comes from um, target data with a, with a cadence of about two minutes okay. uh, or 20 seconds, depending on the star. Mm -hmm. So these are, are targeted observations where you download the pixels and then the, um, the test team produces uh, light curves and corrected light curves and so on. And the main goal, of course, is to find uh, exoplanets for these, uh, for these stars. Um, but as a second data product, we have the full frame images. Ooh, okay. And um, and we get currently we get those at a at a at a cadence of ten minutes. So every ten minutes we get a okay. uh, twenty four by ninety six degree image of the sky. Nice. Um, it used to be every thirty minutes, but now it's been reduced to every uh, every ten minutes. Cool. And Good. and this data is uh, is really of of huge interest for for us in the seismic community, of course. Uh, because um, all the signs we want to do on, on red giants or long period oscillators, classical variables and so on, uh -huh. um, can, be, can be done quite well from, from this full frame image data. Cool. Um, but the, the test team doesn't reduce it. Uh, there's not an official uh, data product from the, uh, from the test team for all this data. Yeah. So we basically just get the, the calibrated full frame images and then, um, then we have to do the rest ourselves. So that was the motivation for building this uh, pipeline. Got it. And, and doing all the photometry and corrections ourselves. Um, so um, in, in our uh, systematics correction here in correcting the, the light curves to, to uh, prepare them for astroseismic analysis, um, we have to... Um, try to serve the entire community as, as best as we can. And of course, this community uh, have interest in many different types of stars that range from uh, solar-like oscillators with, with you know, parts per million uh, amplitude oscillations at, uh, at, the, at the minute uh, frequencies mm -hmm. uh, to our Lyra stars, set beats, and so on, classical pulsators that are uh, coherent uh, have coherent variability and so on. So, huh? um, so it's very very difficult to come up with one correction method. That's okay, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it is basically impossible. That was our conclusion, at least. Yeah. So, so what we wanted to do was to um, build a pipeline that can at least give people or uh, the community um, some reduced data, and we. In, the, in this particular version, we uh, del deliver two data products from okay. two different reduction methods. And then it's up to the user to, to figure out which is the best for their particular science case. Okay. As we'll see later on, the different um, uh, correction methods have pros and cons. So you have to, you have to make your, your best assessment yourself. OK, um, cool. So. We uh, implement, as I said, two methods, one called the CVV method uh, and one called the ensemble method. Yeah. So I think we can scroll down a bit to the, uh, to where we uh, go into the, into the different uh, methods here. So, so the, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the CVV method, so CVV is short for uh, co-trending basis vectors. So both our correction methods, um, mm -hmm are uh, constructed as, as co-trending methods. So we, we try to, to capture um, the signal, uh, the, the shared variability from many stars and use that as a proxy for, uh, for systematic variability that's instrumental related. Okay. Um, so the first method, the CBV method is, is, um, is very much like the, the method that was in, implemented for the uh, for the Kepler pipeline, uh, and it's it's um, fairly robust. Though, as you will see later on, it has a tendency to overfit in some cases. Okay. Um, but but it's a very it's a simple procedure at least to to, to use. Um, a different a difference in our setup uh, versus that of of the of the Kepler team is that 
um, rather than just treating one uh, CCD um, as, a, as one unit and then computing uh, these correction vectors for a whole CCD, we have uh, decided, as you can see in figure two, to, um, to segment okay. each of the CCDs even further. Got it. Okay. And the, the, um, the, the motivation for doing this is that at some, vari some systematic um, variability will have a tendency to uh, have a to, to vary with the with the distance to the camera center so focus changes for instance right right uh, will vary as a distance to the center yeah so we make these areas to to better isolate uh, variations that have this um, have this sort of variability okay. um, so for each of these um, areas we make a set of CPVs and and correct light curves uh, independent from the other areas. Okay. So of course, when you have four cameras, each with four, four CCDs, each with four areas, you get a lot of CPV vectors in the end that we that we can use to uh, correct the time. Cool. Very good. Um, but that's that's one of the main differences between the the Kepler and the and our implementation. Okay. Um, but but just to to briefly uh, run over how we actually then set it up this uh, correction method. Mm -hmm. so we want to we want to build a set of of, um, it's basically a principal component analysis yeah. where you take all the stars um, and then try to to see if you can have if you can find the the, the variability that's common to to all of the stars. So in our setup, as is uh, listed in this um, in this uh, section three one one, mm -hmm. we um, we first of all start by by pruning um, the light curve. So we, we first get rid of the very variable stars because they are, if they are very variable from an astrophysical signal, they will tend to hide the systematic signal. So okay. we first remove a lot of, um, of that variability, uh, taking only the, the, the quiet stars, so to, see, so to say, and then we, then we make sure that we take into account all the quality flags that is actually delivered to us by the, by the test team so yeah. if they know that there has been some event happening, we will of course take care of that and remove or point or treat it in a, in a specific way. Okay, cool. And then we also, um, in step three, we, we make sure to only use the 50% of the stars that have the highest level of, um, of uh, correlation with all the other light curves. Okay. So if, um, if there's a high degree of, of uh, correlation between the light curves, you can assume that it has some systematic common, uh, common source for, for this variability. So we want to retain only the most um, correlated uh, light curves. Okay. We can skip um, step four, I think it's not that interesting. And then we generate the, uh, the CPVs basically by taking this prune set of light curves uh, where we can have um, several hundred thousands of them, and then yeah. we um, we uh, perform a principal component analysis, basically. Um, and we iterate this also, uh, as was also done in in, in, uh, in Kepler. And in this this iteration, we try to figure out if there is one particular target that contributes a lot to a given basis vector. Mm -hmm. Because then it's not really representing the the ensemble. Then it's just the signal coming from this one star. Right. We, we use the the entropy of the light curves to, um, right. to okay. do this, and then get rid of a few highly influential uh, targets for for the generation of the CPV. Okay. Good. Then, Good. then lastly, we um, we uh, check the signal to noise ratio of our derived basis vectors. So yeah. in some cases uh, we see, because we, we compute 16 of these uh, basis vectors. So in some cases, they will look very much like um, white noise. Okay. And it might of course be that part of this variability is actually systematic and common to, the, uh, to all the stars. But we also found that we, we risk introducing a lot of high frequency noise when yeah. we actually use it for correction. 
Yeah. So we also make a, a, a pruning of the CVV vectors before yeah. we can use them. And, uh, and then lastly, in step uh, eight, we, we take our, our yeah. now pruned CVV vectors and then we, yeah. we split them into a normal slow varying component and one that has sort of spikes. Um, yeah. Because in, in, in Kepler or, and, and in TESS also, you see um, strong um, uh, and very, um, very short variations due to momentum dumps of the reaction events. Okay. Uh, so when you have to dump the momentum, you, you get a, a, short, uh, a, a short spike in the light curve. And this happens uh, fairly periodic at 3.1 days. Okay. Um, so we simply separate the, uh, the CBV vectors into a component that's the slower variability and one that, that deals with the spikes. And then okay. these will be fitted independently so that, um, so that you can make sure that, that, these, um, that these spikes are properly accounted for. Because it can be very tricky to 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 capture the exact uh, correct um, uh, coefficient of the CBV vectors if you do if you do not separate them. So um, this is to to make sure that we don't have any residuals here. Cool, I'm with you. Yep. And then uh, in the in the next small uh, paragraph, we 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 basically uh, fit the CBVs to uh, our light curves using. Um, uh, standard least squares uh, yes. And, yes and and we we do this fit also iterating uh, where we where we make a sigma clipping if we have strong outliers that haven't been ah. removed from our earlier steps we make sure that that this is done okay iterative and in the in the next figure you have there you can see a few examples of the um okay of the cultural and basis vectors mm. that mm. be generated and um, so here, just showing the first eight, and you can clearly see that they are different, uh, which of course they should be, um, and that they have typically this uh, two-week periodicity um, that corresponds to the uh, to the orbit of of tests. Ah, um, sure. okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, and then you have the data downlink there in the middle, where where the data is transferred to Earth. So, so the top panel here shows this uh, after separating this the CPV out into two components. Uh, the top one is the slow variability, and then the bottom one is this spike CPV, where you clearly see this 3.1 day periodicity of the momentum dumps, and and some a, a lot of funny stuff happening around the data downlink where uh, where you're very close to to the Earth. Um, and I think in the next um, in the next figure, which jumps a bit into the next. Oh, okay. this is still a CB. Uh, excuse me, CBV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the areas. So down here, we've we've tried to to indicate the difference uh, between the the different areas Ooh. you have for a given uh, for a given camera. So. Um, each of for, for each of these uh, four lines, you have the different CCDs, and then you have your areas corresponding to this figure we saw in the beginning. This is all for camera four, and then as you, as you move out from area one to area four, so you can see that they are indeed uh, uh, there. There is indeed some difference between them that uh, that uh, ensures us at least that it was a good idea to try and uh, mm -hmm. capture some of this variability from different uh, areas. Cool. Um, cool. So this is this is one of the method, and um, and it's 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 super simple. And of course, um, as you will, as we can see uh, later on, uh, we have we haven't um, at, in the current uh, implementation put any priors on on uh, coefficients of the fit and so on. So uh, we will tend to overfit in some cases if the variability if the um, if the astrophysical variability is a very high amplitude or long time scale, the CBVs will will be will happily remove a lot of that signal. Yeah. If uh, if right. we if we do not put priors on the uh, on the coefficients. Okay. Cool. Um, yep. So that motivated us to to try a different method as well, which we call the 
ensemble method. Mm -hmm. And the ensemble method is is um, it's a bit of this. It's the same uh, philosophy of trying to capture the variability of 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 many of the other stars as a as a proxy for the uh, systematic variability. Um, but in the ensemble method, we um, instead of using CBVs, we make uh, just a, a, an average light curve out of stars that are very nearby on the detector plane. Okay. So the idea is that you, for a given star, we calculate some some metrics of variability, uh, so the median, the the range, and the variability of first differences in the light curve. And then we want to build an ensemble of other light curves that uh, of other stars that we want to make our our average light curve that we will use for our correction. Um, so we will start off by uh, potentially 100 candidates that could go into this um, average light curve. Okay. And these are determined by the simply the Euclidean proximity to our target star on the detector. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> we identify these potential candidates and then we then we start to look through. For each of them, we determine, first of all, if their variability is very high, then we do not want to include it, similar as before, because it can, it can hide a lot of the systematic variability. So this is also a pruning step of the highly variable or highly noisy uh, stars. Mm -hmm. And then once we have at least five stars that meet this uh, criteria, okay. Then we we start to make uh, fits to the target light curve, and then uh, uh, okay. gradually try to add another candidate, another candidate, another candidate, and all the way uh, we we track the quality of the of the correction. Yeah. And um, okay. Typically, we end up having an ensemble stars, uh, an ensemble of approximately uh, ten stars, ten of them. Yeah. Make more stars. Probably all the same. And. Spectrum. We shouldn't go into to any of these equations because uh, that can that can get uh, a bit complicated. But uh, the basic idea is that we make just a, an average or a median light curve out of all these ten, ten ensemble stars. Okay. And we make sure to uh, so what you see in this uh, equation is that we make small corrections to the background level um, for for the star because. In our photometry module, which comes before this, the module that delivers our raw data, mm -hmm. a very important uh, part of that pipeline is to correct for the background in the images. Yes. Uh, and, and that's highly variable in, in tests and uh, a much bigger problem than it was in, in Kepler, for instance. Yeah. And, and we have noticed that in some cases, even stars of similar magnitude that lie very close to each other, they do not uh, result in the same flux, even though they're quiet stars. So mm -hmm. we make small adjustments to the background level to to um, to, yeah. to put them on the same scale, so, so to speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we we simply uh, apply this uh, ensemble correction again. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, allow for a, an adjustment in the absolute level, yeah. and then and that's basically the only um, adjustable parameter we have. We optimize for the for the shift. Of the flux level for our correction, and then we then we perform right. our corrected light curve. Okay. Um, That's a little and and yeah. this um, so where the CBV method has a tendency to overfit, uh, I would say that the ensemble method more has a tendency to underfit because yeah. it's super mm -hmm. robust, and it takes a lot for it to to um, to change basically. But it's also uh, one of the benefits is that it's very local in nature. Right, it, it, it captures the variability from the from the nearest stars on the yeah. detector. Mm -hmm. So if there's some very localized noise, it will tend tend to capture that better than the CBV, which has cool. the entire area to take care of. Right. Okay. Um, cool. I guess. So in the in the next section, we we have a few performance uh, metrics. Okay. Of course, it's um. I, and maybe you can go to the next figure uh, because this is just the ensemble pipeline here. Uh, okay. And the next one again, figure seven. So um, it's of course 
impossible really to give a, a good metric of the quality of the corrected light curve because it depends um, entirely on the star that you're looking at sure and the kind of variability that you that this uh, target has so of course the end goal is to isolate the astrophysical signal and that varies from star to star so <laughs> these uh, metrics are difficult to to really use to assess the quality of a, of a, of a certain star but at least we can say something about the average noise levels and so on. Right. So um, if you go to the next figure, this figure six is part of this background correction. Ooh, um, here we go. Okay, let's so, move that up a bit. So these are just um, examples of, um, for, for a given uh, sector, uh, the observation or the the values we have for different commonly used noise statistics, okay. such as the one hour root mean square, mm -hmm. point to point yes. variability in the middle, yes, tracks the very high frequency noise, and then the overall variability of, uh, variance of the light curve. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, and so the 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 different colors correspond to the different methods, either the raw CV mm -hmm. ensemble. Yeah. Very nice. Uh -huh. And uh, and then the, oh. the the dots there is just basically, as far as I remember, tracking the 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 last one percentile of the uh, of the uh, one part per thousand of the data. So all of the all of the star all of the stars are basically confined within these uh, these um, these curves here. Contours, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. contours, yeah. Yep. Um, so. Yep. Uh, what we basically see here is that, at least in terms of um, RMS and point to point, our lower envelope matches very well the expectations that we would um, have okay. for a more or less noise free uh, star. And uh, you can also see there that if you compare the con contours from the raw uh, to the correct versions, there isn't a lot of, of difference there. So. This tells us that on the one hour and on the very high frequency uh, timescales, the uh, the corrections doesn't really change the light curves here, which yeah. is which is good. We don't want to to mess too much with that. But okay. the main uh, change from, from our corrections is found in the overall uh, variance of the light curve, which of course also contains the um, the longer t longer term variability that would be attributed to systematics. So this is very much as, as expected. Um, but uh, a better view of, of, of the pros and cons of these different methods and how well it works is, is probably found in the uh, ensemble, in the example light curves that you can see in, in one of the next figures. Um, oh, light curves, there we go. OK. So. Okay. We basically took uh, 200 uh, random light curves and then um, processed them and, and looked through them to see uh, that the kind of differences that were that were for for stars where we could see a strong astrophysical signal, and um, and these nicely illustrates the the different the pros and cons of the method. So, uh, for instance, in, in in panels A and B here, you have two long period variable stars, so they have a variability of the order. Of of these 27 days of the yes. sector. Okay. And the amplitude of the variability is also very high. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that um, yeah. the ensemble method is much better than the CVV method because, of course, when the CVV method sees this and you make a least squares fit, you remove most of it. That's how it is. Yes, right. And, and you also intend to introduce a lot of, uh, a lot of things, of course. Whereas the robustness of the ensemble method um, tends to, to not do this. So this actually preserves the astrophysical signal uh, a lot better. Interesting, sure. And you can see also in, in panel A, for instance, in the, um, at, at, towards the end of the light curve that in the raw data, there's a lot of, um, of high frequency noise which is actually removed quite well in the ensemble light curve. And this is because it's some it's a very localized noise signal. And of course, the ensemble light curve can can deal with this. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it actually 
improves a lot on the on the raw photometry also and, and preserves the um, the astrophysical stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the same uh, can can be seen in, in the lower parts. These are much quieter stars, but you can see in these cases also um, the ensemble method actually tends to do quite well also with these momentum dumps that are illustrated with the with the red uh, lines at the bottom. Ah. This is where we would expect to see these dumps. Okay. And in panel D, for instance, you see them quite clearly in the raw photometry. But in this case, the ensemble method was actually quite good at correcting these. They, they are not left in the in the yellow uh, points anymore. And also a lot of the systematics near the data downlink uh, have been removed. So these are cases where the ensemble method works quite well. And in general, for the long period variables, the ensemble method is, is the best. Mm, got it. Okay. Yes. So yeah, the that. next figure um, yeah. okay. gives a few more examples. Um, Ooh, wow. <coughs> yep. Uh, wow. Yeah. So in these cases, um, here we had a, had, a, had a shorter period range where both methods do quite well. So here, the uh, CBV method doesn't overfit as much anymore. Right. Um, and as you can see, while both right. methods do quite well, the CBV, CBV method generally is better at correcting um, small-term systematics. Okay. So again, of course, the ensemble method is, is very robust and, um, and doesn't necessarily uh, fit a lot. It, does, it tends to overfit in these cases. So you can see, for instance, in panel D, there's in the ensemble method some residual systematics uh, left. Yes. Where this is basically removed in the, in the CBV method. And a general trend you can see in from this figure is also that overall the CBV method is much better at correcting these momentum dumps um, because we have the spike CBVs, which are designed to take care of exactly that problem. Um, so, so in general, you get uh, cleaner light curves and better removal of small-term systematics from the CBV method. And uh, in the in the next um, figure, we have uh, a few plots of um, solar-like oscillators. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so these are two um, red giants with. Um, okay fairly low frequency oscillations with a yes nyquist around 30 40 microhertz and you see both methods also tend to do fairly well mm -hmm. but if you look in the in the frequency domain uh, in the power spectra to the yeah. to the right okay you can see first of all that the reduction or the the correction has a, an impact okay it matters that we do this that to remove a lot of the noise from the raw data uh -huh. um, but secondly, you can see that um, that the CBV method generally has a lower high frequency noise because it can it can it's better at operating at these uh, high frequency yes. time scales. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, yep. generally, for the solar lag oscillators, you get better results from the CBV method. So um, as you can see, both of, both methods have have a lot of pros and cons and. Uh, it depends on your application, which, which you need to do. Exactly. And of course, you should always look at the data. <laughs> yeah. Look at as, as many light curves uh, as possible, and not only from us, but with others on the market as well, to, to get the best results. OK. Uh, um, and the, inset, the inset plots are uh, an autocorrelation? It's, a, it's the power of power. So it's taking the small area around the um, this hump you see in, in, in power, okay, and then taking the, the power spectrum of that. Got it. Okay. So it's, it's basically the auto autocorrelation in, in yeah, time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because it, for, for, for these red giants, you and solar like oscill oscillators in general, you have a more or less uh, regular pattern in, yes. in your frequencies. And this is what, what shows up here as the, as the peak. That's so the dashed line indicates the expected. Um, okay. Okay. the half frequency of the expected 
the large frequency separation from okay. the location of the power. I'm with you. So yeah. at least we can see that we that we can also potentially do science on these oscillations. Indeed. Awesome. Um, and then the the next figure, I believe, um, shows a different um, application. Of course, our method is is mainly developed for the astro seismic community. But uh, sorry, it's not the next figure. It's the next figure again, I think. This nope. just shows you the problem with the desaturation. Do I go to figure 12? Uh, yes, I think it's figure 12. So it's one with the planets. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. This one. So, of course, it's mainly developed for the seismic community, but I mean, for every sector, we um, produce one to two million light curves for uh, for for stars in this in this area. Yes. So there's a huge amount of, of, of data, of course, and uh, and and there's a lot of other applic applications than just seismology. It can be uh, study of rotational signals. Uh, exoplanet binaries flares and so on mm -hmm. so in this case in on this in this uh, figure we just wanted to highlight that that yeah. you could also get planet signals out of uh, out of our data so we have um, this is for 120 second uh, data and therefore we only have the cbv method because um, in the current setup the ensemble method isn't really doing too well with uh. the um, shorter cadence because yeah. there's a lot of flu fewer uh, short cadence stars and of course you have to build your ensemble so you have to have enough right like an ensemble <laughs> and that becomes a problem for the ensemble so <clears throat> currently it's only the cbv okay. um, so in this comparison we have we show in in blue our uh, value from the cbv method Yes. And then um, in red and green, we show the results from the official uh, pipeline uh, okay. output. Okay. Uh, Spock. Um, uh -huh. And and the difference in the in the two colors is uh, a difference in in sort of the final processing of the Spock light curves because um, Spock also uh, provides the service of actually correcting for um, for contamination. Of nearby stars, yeah. and an estimate of how much flux was actually captured in this aperture that they set. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. uh, I think in some cases you can argue that that there are over or under corrections, uh, and that's why we we do not we do not perform any of these corrections. We leave it to the experts to uh, to do this correction afterwards. So yeah. The, the blue and the and the yellow really gives the the better comparison because here, here we are back engineer the correction the spark light curve so yeah. in many cases you can see that we actually correspond quite well maybe uh, coro 18 is the is the strongest one of the strongest outliers um, but in general our signals agree quite well and then, of course, it also depends on how well you corrected your background and the raw photometry and so on. This has a lot, of, lot to say. Yeah. But this at least should uh, illustrate that Busy. people interested in exoplanets or, or binaries should also um, find our data on, on mass and, uh, and, and use it for their science. Nice. Um, and then I think we get into yeah a few of the so figures 13 and 14 are just to show some of the yields that as i said before you you tend to get fewer of the very bright stars uh, right. for the ensemble method because you need to find similar stars nearby and uh, again for the 120 second data you only have the cbb yes um so these are just a few of the of the of the yield figures that, in general, we we return a lot uh, corrected light curve from most of the of the raw photometry that we produce. And then figure fourteen is just to show uh, an example of a runtime where we took a whole sector of data, okay. and tried to correct it on one of our nodes at the, at the lo local supercomputer uh -huh. to see can we actually keep up with demand. And there we go. And, uh, <laughs> and it. it it turns out, at least for the processing, it we can. It's not a problem, so we can process uh, 
a whole sector of of, um, of, of data. So this is a 1.6 million light curves that we can correct in about 0.3 days with the CBV method. Very nice. 0.7 days for the ensemble method. So we are well within the 27 days and the photometric reduction itself takes up the order of one to two weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we're in a steady steady state, we should uh, be able to um, to meet demands. And a lot of this is actually wait time from having to, to write. So it's a lot of IO issue. <clears throat> But of course, it's a lot of data we're dealing with. I mean, the raw photometry in itself is a couple of terabytes per sector, and we have to download it first. So mm. that's, right. we, there are some issues that we, we're still uh, we're still trying to find out. And with issues, right. very cool. Um, but Orange. hopefully, we should we should catch up at some point. Cool. In the reduction. Yeah. Well, I like this plot. Very nice. <laughs> and. Uh, and then this this final plot is just to to give sort of an, an outlook <coughs> of, um, of potential improvements uh, of the pipeline because our current setup is 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 the ba most basic at least for the CBV method. I mean, we we do not have priors on coefficients or, or anything, and, and right. have this tendency to overfit. And of course, our end goal would would be that we have only one method, deliver only one light curve that we can ensure is the best okay. for a given target. Okay. So this um, this figure illustrates the, the potential of, of uh, actually trying to constrain priors as uh, p position dependent priors. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. These coefficients. So in this run, we, we simply processed all the stars in a given camera and then the the color here shows the um, the coefficient of a given CBV vector. So he would just pick CBV number one for all the stars and then plot the uh, the coefficient from the from our fit. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So uh -huh. you can see that there there are some quite struck. There's a lot of structure in this and also. Large connected regions where you have um, um, the same sort of variability. Mm -hmm. So this tells us that if we can actually use this information to yeah. put priors on our coefficients, we say we, we know it should be more or less like this in this region. Then we then we reduce the risk of overfitting an Alaire star or yeah. something like that with the with the CBV method. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. You can see that. For instance, in, in, in the lower right panel, CCD3, you can see quite quite strongly these different areas. And that's just because the CBV number one captures different signals in the two areas, because the areas are independent. Yes. Mm -hmm. so it could be that, that what corresponds to CBV number one in one area is CBV number two in another area. Um, but in, in at least CCD1 and CCD2, you can see that it captures more or less the same variability. So, so that's one of the things we want to, to implement is to put um, uh, informed priors on our uh, coefficients. And we also would like to, to extend it to, uh, to multi-scale, you could say, though, that we um, have different CBVs for different time scales of the light curve. So this is similar to what was done in the in the Kepler era as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, um, the, the really final end, end goal will be an iteration also with our classification pipeline. Yes. Because when we have corrected a light curve and then we can have our classification tell us that this is an Alire or this is a Delta yeah. Scuti star. Exactly. Then we can make a lot more informed decisions on the on how to correct them and and make this an iteration in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's more or less the status at where we are at right now. But you know the pipeline is implemented and it's it's running, but we're not we're not <laughs> fully uh, meeting the the monthly delivery of of data in our reduction. Yet. Unfortunately, but um, oh, you got a monthly schedule. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Very nice. 
Mikael, <clears throat> thank you so much. And then we end off and there's actual Fitz headers here. So if people want to take a look at those uh, in the appendices, that's great. Uh, Mikael, thank you so much for walking us through the, uh, the test pipeline on the light curve systematics. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. So you touched on a little bit there at the, at the end uh, where you'd like to do some, some weighted priors on the, the data coming in. Um, and that was sort of a, a lead. Um, so I just wanna ask sort of where do, where do we go from here? Let's say over the next two to five years, uh, probably there might probably already work in progress on, on figuring out what those uh, weighted priors are. Uh, other things, can aspects of this pipeline be applied to future seismology missions? Let's say Plato, for example, um, and that. So, so, so just kind of where, where do we go over the next two to five years? Well, I mean, definitely the next two to five years would be an extension of, of the methods and trying to narrow it down to delivering one light curve. Yeah. So we reduce the work from all the users uh, and make this, uh, th make this informed iteration with the classification pipeline. That would mm -hmm. really be mm -hmm. uh, an amazing result ideal. Yeah. Uh, if we could do that. And then, of course, we, um, I mean, there's always a manpower issue because it takes a lot, a long time to do these kind of things, and, and it's difficult to to get the manpower to do it. But ideally, we would also like to to do a much larger study where we compare all the different pipelines that are on the market. Ooh, um, yes. Because of course, it's not only our pipeline; there are many others. Um, typically, they are focused on, you know, where you can apply it uh, at your own computer for a single target. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, where, of course, we have the benefit of having all the data at, at once, but making a lot of comparisons to sort of make a best use guide for the uh, for the community on, on how to to best do science on different uh, targets. Yeah. Very and cool. I'm sure that some of this could be uh, could be done on, on Plato, of course, in the in the basic um, in the basic reduction of the data for for astro seismology we already are starting to implement a lot of these um, typically filtering uh, methods that have been used also and developed for for kepler um, and that's of course focused mainly on stochastic oscillators where you can better get away with doing Detrending, high pass mm. filtering, and these sort of things. So yeah. that's right. where I'm mainly involved in, in Plato. Right. Um, but I'm sure a lot of this could be adapted to, to Plato. That shouldn't be an issue. I mean, we're already adapting it to uh, the varying cadences of, of tests, which is now right. made three times as much data for us, <laughs> the latest reduction. So, um, <laughs> I mean, the, the pipeline is, is very modular and everything is open source. So of course, uh, we yeah. also hope that the community will, uh, will take part in delivering the best possible pipeline for the seismology community. Very cool, very nice. Mikael, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing some of the future work coming out of this uh, pipeline as you start to tighten it up and deliver one data product with the best light curves. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank and that'll you. do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.